two thirds of the American public think it's, it's okay to utilize the drone program. And uh, I think a, a, a huge percentage of them think it's okay to <clears throat> actually kill somebody without due process. I think about a half to a third of them. So we got 30 or 40 percent of the people that think it's okay to kill people without trials now. And 60 or 70 percent of the people think that the drone program is a great idea. What the hell, you know? I mean, I, I don't think anybody really understands the Constitution or what's going on here. <clears throat> uh, I guess everybody. I could you hear that question? Okay. Oh, you want me to repeat it anyway? Well, I, I don't know. I just made me a response. Or a large percentage some... of Americans think that using drones is okay. A majority. Well, this is why at Veterans for Peace, we've uh, kind of embarked on the domestic side issue. Because, to be honest, I don't think a lot of Americans are really bothered by some child being blown up 10,000 miles away for some reason. I, I don't know. So we can't effectively uh, get to them that way. So what we're doing is we're going for the domestic issue, making the people understand that their situation here is being threatened. Not only by you know domestic use of drones that I outlined, but also by us you know killing, uh, 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 creating more enemies than we're killing, okay. which is a result of a lot of reports. So. So that's our thrust, you know, at the moment to try to get people thinking, just thinking about the technology. It's kind of like the telephone when, before they had wiretaps, you know, and before they had telephones and it came out, nobody thought wiretaps were a big deal until a number of people's lives were ruined, and then they put laws in place that are restricted to control it. And that's kind of the way we have to do with this technology because people, <laughs> they don't understand it. So essentially, you're using the same strategy that the government <laughs> uses against us to uh, <clears throat> initiate uh, awareness regarding the people. I mean... That's right. the goal. That's the goal. <clears throat> yep. Make the people uh, think critically about this technology. And then maybe they'll be thinking about what we're doing internationally. The only thing they're talking about in Washington right now is the president's war, president's war powers. That has nothing to do with anything else we're talking about tonight. Yeah, um, when, when the white paper came out where it became clear that Americans could be killed probably on American soil without due process, that's when everybody freaked out because now we're talking about killing Americans, as Dave said. Um, but I think that one way that we can convince people that using drones on other people in other countries is not, it is not a good idea is because, and, and top generals have confirmed, that when we kill civilians with these drones in other countries, it actually <coughs> creates more hatred against the United States. It makes people want to do us more harm. It makes us more vulnerable to terrorism when they see that we're killing their children, when we see that then we go back and we kill people at the funeral. We kill people who are rescuing the wounded. And so I think if we make those connections in addition to talking about use, the use of drones domestically, that that might be effective as well. Yeah. Mark, I had a quick question for you. What, uh, what governing body... Uh, sorry, I had a question myself. What uh, governing body would have uh, oversight on uh, civilian homeland drones? Well, Congress um, is asking questions now. They want to get some of these classified memos. Um, and evidently, when the nomination of Chuck Hagel for Secretary of Defense was being basically held up, um, the Obama administration supposedly did turn over some of these, um, some of these um, memos. But Congress should have oversight. And agencies that are established by Congress should also have oversight. Um, but so far, there hasn't really been any legislation. I think Dave mentioned that. So this is because this is kind of a new area. But Congress, we've gotten Congress's attention, or rather Obama has gotten Congress's attention. And I think you're going to see a lot of legislation being introduced into Congress now and see agencies that Congress has established taking jurisdiction over these issues.
Rick. Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank everybody for the presentation and, and mention, um, for those who didn't get a schedule of what's happening on April 4th through 7th in San Diego, we've got a table outside in the lobby and, and stop by and pick it up. We've got a lot of events going on. I hope that people come and hope that people tell your friends about it. But I'd also like to make a comment, if, if that's okay, because it seems to me that the um, presentations sort of beg the question as why these things are happening. There was this uh, thing that was going on under the collateral uh, murder, is it called, yeah. the, the video, and it was talking about the Philippines war, and, and people have been talking about what's going on in El Salvador, Vietnam, Iraq, and so forth. And my sense is that there are three kinds of explanations that have been raised within our society about this. And one of them is what you might call the Nixon-Bush-Obama um, idea that, well, we've got to fight the bad guys. That, that's why we're doing this, is to fight the bad guys before they, they come and get us. And then there's another one that uh, Dave Patterson raised, and, and Dave and I are working together, so I'm not... Um, saying this in an antagonistic kind of way, because many people do feel this, that the reason these things are going on is because the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower talked about it, has to make profits. And so these, these things are actually being done to make money for Neil Blue. And, and I don't think that's entirely false. But I think there's a third explanation that for me is the fundamental one, and it has to do with the nature of the capitalist system under which we live. And what's going on in these wars is a drive for expansion, a drive to get natural resources, a drive to get cheap labor, and a drive to fight against strategic competitors. And these competitors vary from time to time. So I think to, to wind up, I'm sorry that I'm taking this time, but I'm really not. But anyway, <laughs> because I think this is important, and I think it needs to come out, and I think it really wasn't coming out from the panelists. So, so what does Obama say? Obama is saying, we can do this better than Bush can. He's not changing the, the objectives of the government. He say, yeah, he's saying that it's better to use special ops. It's better to use robotic warfare. It's better to use drones than it is to send troops out. But we have to question what it's being used for as well as how it's being used. Yes, sir. Um, it seems to me that we don't get the opportunity to ask the questions. We're told uh, we're in a, a, a system that, for all intents and purposes, should be done. We've moved into um, people. Young people seem to have this understanding that we're about unity, about working together, about recognizing our similarities rather than our differences. And everything we're talking about is about separating ourselves from other people. The people in Iraq in Africa, in India, <coughs> we're one humanity here on this planet. We're not separate, and we keep seeing ourselves as separate. So as long as we keep doing that and not teaching each other that we're one, we will continue to seek ways to separate ourselves, and it will always end up in not trying to dominate somebody else, because that's been what we've done for thousands of years. So we seem to be perpetuating the same paradigm over and over again, even though young people look at the Arab Spring, look at the Occupy movement. These are all things that are showing us that young people today want change. They want a world where we're working cooperatively together. And I just don't see enough young people, especially in San Diego, and I'm with you. I, I, I've just noticed that there's not a lot of activism. I mean, there's a lot of talk about activism. But people are not hitting, hitting the streets. They're afraid. And I'm not really even sure what they're afraid of. I don't know if it's the military or if it's the police that have a heavy hand. But people aren't taking enough action. And any time that there's successful action, that means you've got to hit the streets. And you've got to put yourself in harm's way sometimes. And be willing to get arrested if that's what it takes. But if you look at the successful protests, they have always been peaceful, <coughs> consistent presence. And I just don't see that here. Why do you think that is? Anybody want to tackle that question? Maurice? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> but um, I, I did want to have a question that, that might sort of tie into that to Marjorie, which I think is, is um, sovereignty rights and where, uh, about sovereignty rights <coughs> and these drones going into foreign countries like one in Afghanistan, we're uh, also flying drones in Africa, we just set up a new base in Africa. 
Uh, I was just wondering, what is the international violation of the law is going in and murdering people from the sky? Is that considered an act of war going into these foreign countries? And uh, how is that maybe uh, related to any uh, violation of the UN resolutions? Yes, it certainly is. And that violates the UN Charter. Once again, we cannot use force against people in other countries um, unless we're doing it in self-defense. And people in Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia have not attacked us. And, and uh, in fact, I, this is a little bit outside the topic of this panel, but um, I have written extensively, and I think some others have as well, not many, um, that the war in Afghanistan is also illegal. Um, that, that violates the UN Charter. Afghanistan never attacked the United States. 19 men, uh, 15 of whom were from Saudi Arabia, committed a crime against humanity and should people who were involved in that should be tried as criminals. Um, but but uh, that also is an illegal war. Um, I want to just respond um, to, to a couple of the points that were made and I want to re refer people to uh, a publication that's called Addicted to War, and I think that Veterans for Peace might have put it out, or somebody from Veterans for Peace. Um, it's a comic book. It's, it's this big, and it's thin, and it's, it's uh, illustrated with cartoons, and it's an incredible history of the United States interventions. It's a little out of date now, but there's plenty of them in there, and they're all tied to protecting corporate power. Um, and it's, it's really an amazing history. I've used it as a reference. It's in Spanish as well. Um, when Clinton, the night before Clinton started the NATO bombing of Kosovo, he said, a lot of people had, hadn't heard this, he said, we have to be able to sell to markets around the world, that's what this Kosovo thing is all about. And meanwhile we're being told it's about ethnic cleansing and certainly that was going on on both sides and it went way, way back. But if Saddam Hussein had said to the U.S. government, U.S. corporations, you know, come on in and we'll give you some sweet oil deals, he'd still be there. There's no doubt about it. And if you look at the number of bases we have around the world, seven to eight hundred in different countries, it's all about maintaining geographical hegemony to keep the stability, because stability is number one for foreign investment. It doesn't matter if they're communist or uh, Islamic fundamentalist or terrorist or what. As long as there's stability, that's where foreign investment, U.S. investment thrives. And that's why I, I think that is, is the main thing. I think there were also some right-wing biblical prophecies that talked about the Middle East and keeping Israel in Jewish hands, the, the Temple Mount. Um, so that when Christ comes back, um, the Jews will convert to Christianity or be killed in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the biblical prophecy will be fulfilled, probably a stronger chance of that than if it remains in Muslim hands or if it is in Muslim hands. So I think that was part of it, but I also think that the neoconservative geopolitical agenda was much stronger. And, and, and as you said, we're going into Africa with these drones and Obama is one thing he's learned from history is that when Americans get killed, um, uh, other Americans don't like that. And so if we can just kill them remotely, other people who aren't Americans, then there won't be so much, uh, so much opposition to it. And that's why we have these, uh, these drones. But pilots who are piloting these drones from 6,000 miles away are developing post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's a very, very frightening development, I think. I'm just going to address the we woman's the question. A couple more questions. Okay, I'm going to address this one woman's question first, which was, you know, getting young people involved. You know, that is a very complex issue. But only thing I can say is that if you are not, for example, directly involved in veterans, the student veterans for peace, start hanging out with them. Bring some friends in. Start hanging out with other peace groups. See, what, see if you can get some friends to go along with you to get involved, you know, bit by bit, just a couple of people, and find some kind of way that you all can work together, because that's the only way this thing's going to grow. 